Good morning. Today's reading is from Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 10. And Alan gave me the message version to read. Good friends, don't forget all I've taught you. Take to heart my commands. They'll help you live a long, long time, a long life, live full and well. Don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and the eyes of the people. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try and figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one that will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Your barns will burst and your wine vats will brim over. by your heads with me. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the freedom that we have to come and hear your word, Lord. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches, Lord, so that we may be a light to this world, to this community. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ, that he, without saying a word, went and paid the price for our sins, that he didn't need to, to prove his innocence or protest or anything, that we know he was the innocent uh, blood, the, the spotless lamb that you sent to sacrifice for our sins. And we thank you, Lord, for the power of the resurrection, Lord, that we know that our Savior is in heaven preparing a place for us and that we are sealed by the Spirit until the day that we meet Jesus face to face. So help us to walk in step with the Spirit, Lord, to be that light to this world that you have called us to be, to give up our lives to serve our King and Lord. We thank you today, especially for fathers that, that have been there to um, guide the path for us, Lord, but we pray that, that also that we honor our fathers regardless because we know that they're the fathers that you've given them to us. So we just thank you for this day that we can take time to set aside to honor them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this, You Feed Them, because we're getting into that part of Luke, and if you want to read more about the feeding of the 5,000 and you would want to read John, it's probably a lot more extensive. But basically, that in literal translations is this. Give them you to eat. How are we going to feed this crowd? Jesus is teaching and preaching, and the crowds are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because everybody wants to know who Jesus is. Why? Why do you want to know who Jesus is? What's your answer when you find that? Do you want Jesus, when you find Him, to be, to be your Savior? Of course you want to be saved. But do you want Him to be Lord of your life? Your life is not your own. It, you were created and you were purchased by the blood of the Lamb if you believe in Jesus Christ. To do the good works, as Ephesians 2.10 says, that God planned before the existence of time that you are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So how are we going to feed this crowd? How are we going to do this? Give them you to eat. And all through Luke's gospel, he's been trying to increase their faith. Besides, Luke has been presenting clearly who Jesus Christ is. But as we see the miracles and the different stories that Luke is writing about, you see that there's a problem here that most people have, and that's a lack of true faith, especially when times get hard, when you think that it's just beyond the capabilities whatsoever, what would be hard about Jesus feeding this crowd of people? He did so many other things. Why would they not have faith by this point? It's been two years that the disciples have been going with Jesus, and now he's going to be heading out to Jerusalem to be the Passover lamb, and he needs his disciples to step up and help him present the gospel message to the kingdom of Israel and what they will present to the Gentile nations as well. They believe, and they have faith, but they need to learn to practice, to put their faith into more real terms so that they can follow Jesus and be like Jesus in this world. 
So in chapter 9, Jesus gives the 12. We find out later that he gives more. He gives them power and authority and sends them out. And you know the Great Commission, you know you've been given power and authority in this world also. The same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. The same power that was in creation. The Spirit lives inside of you. You are God's temple. You are that conduit for people to come to, the, to God through the Holy Spirit, and you are that vessel that's being used to present the Word. Wow. So we, we're to this point where we're trained up, we're sent out, and Jesus tells them to go out without basically anything to carry. And that's not necessarily what we want to do every time, but hey, what if we did that sometimes and didn't worry about, oh, we've got to have this much money, we've got to have this much training, we've got to have this and this, and we just went out. Would Jesus not provide for us, even from a child's simple food basket? It's not, not a problem to plan and everything. And later we see that Jesus does tell them to take a purse and stuff with them. He even tells them to take a sword with them. But in this case, he tells them not to take really anything with them because he wants them to learn to be dependent upon him. And we just came from reading the passages in Luke where there was desperate faith for Jesus and desperate faith resulted in miracles. The healing of the woman and the raising of the uh, synagogue leader's daughter. <clears throat> if you had desperate faith and trust Jesus, would you maybe get out of the boat and walk on water? If you didn't, would you maybe miss out on seeing that miracle? Wouldn't you like to live a kind of life, that kind of faith where... You weren't worried about anything. You were so desperate for Jesus, you just did whatever the Holy Spirit led you to do, unequipped and insignificant as you are. And you might just see a miracle. Reading the same passage from Proverbs chapter 3 out of the NIV, My son, do not forget my teachings. So what did Jesus teach and do then? But keep my commandments in your hearts, especially Jesus' commands to love one another for they will prolong your life for many years this is a promise to those that are obedient who walk by faith and bring you peace and prosperity peace that only Jesus give peace that surpasses all understanding let love and faithfulness never leave you love as God has loved you which is firm in faith <clears throat> Bind them around your neck. Seriously, these are Jesus' commands. It's a lifestyle. It's not a suggestion. Write them on the tablets of your heart. For out of the good things stored up inside of a man's heart, there's abundance that flows out. Then you will win favor and a good name. Isn't that what the name Christian means? To be like Christ? In the sight of God and man, a child of God, a servant of His kingdom a light shining in the darkness for men to see. <laughs> Who would light a lamp and then hide it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The opposite of trust is fear, isn't it? Do you trust Jesus with everything then? And lean not on into your own understanding. Yeah, use your brain, but have the mindset of Christ that drives your brain and your heart. In all your ways submit to Him, not some, but all. Jesus is Lord of all and every knee will bow, so are you bowing now? And He will make your path straight. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and He is the only way of life that leads to the Father. Do not be wise in your own eyes, or you might just fool yourself. <laughs> we were purchased, we are a new creation in Jesus Christ to do good works. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Reverent awe of God to do His will in spite of of man's attempts to stop you. Be holy, therefore, before, because your heavenly Father is holy. This will bring health to your body. Jesus did not come to the healthy. He came to the sick to heal them. And nourishment to your bones. True life, abundant life, here and now, and life eternal for those who believe and walk by faith. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Be rich in words and deeds as God has richly given to you. With the first fruit of your crops, be sure to give your very best, not your leftovers. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, storing up treasures in heaven. 
and your vats will brim over with new wine. Then the message didn't say that about new wine, but we know that Jesus talked about that earlier, this new wine, because there's a reason for celebration. Is that how you live your life? Do people, when they see you and associate you with Christ, see the overabundance of joy and love in your life because you are saved and you know it and your life surely shows it. In chapter 9, after Jesus sends out the 12, they return. Jesus then feeds the 5,000, which is, could have been 13,000. You probably see if you do a lot of studies, but I mean, it could have been 12, 15, could have been 20,000 people. Can you imagine that many people? Because they saw Jesus out on the lake, saw he was coming, and they all came to him because they wanted to know who Jesus is. But as like I said, if you read John, you'll realize in, in this feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, and not many would follow him after that. They didn't want that kind of teaching. They said, who can accept this? So Jesus separates the fan from the followers, the ones who want physical bread versus those who want living bread. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah, and Jesus predicts his death and says what it, what it means to truly be a disciple. Luke 9.23 is, the, parap- is a, the quotation from Luke of this verse. To deny yourself, to take up your cross daily, Luke says, and to follow me. Wait a minute, why are we talking about crosses yet? Because Jesus hadn't even been to the cross yet, but he's telling you to take up your cross before we ever know that Jesus took up his cross for us. To take up this instrument of suffering and death because you've got to put to death the old man God already did it for you, but you've got to realize it and do it and quit waging a battle between the flesh and the spirit and let the spirit guide you into all truth because it is the kind of worshipers that the fathers are seeking, those who worship in spirit and in truth. So are you a true disciple or do you really just want physical bread? Will you take up your cross and follow after Jesus? Eight days later, Jesus is transfigured before Peter's very eyes. He gets a glimpse of what the future is like, and he sees Jesus being partially restored to his glory that was before and knows that that's a glory that we can have confident hope in. So will this quench all the doubts? Will this help his faith increase? Will this give Peter enough faith to walk on water? How about you? How is your faith? Is it completely confident in God and His plans for you, regardless of what the situations are in your life? Do you walk by faith rather than by sight? You can't save yourself, and you can't save anyone else. It is by God's grace that you get up each day and you can live your life for Him. The pagans get up, don't thank God, and live them li- their lives for themselves. And their destination is their appetite of their stomach. It is the destruction of their souls. And they will spend an eternity apart from God. You cannot do anything, period, outside of God's grace upon grace upon grace that He gives you each day. John 4, 23 said, Yet a time is coming, has now come, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Are you worshiping? Are you living your life in spirit and the truth of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh and dwelling among us, the only way, the only truth, the only life? Do you trust in the words of the Bible? Do you understand Jesus' commandments are true and that they lead to eternal life? Are you born again by the Spirit and are you walking by faith? Because He has given you a commission. He has sent you out no matter where that's at, whether you realize it or not, and you are to be His light, His ambassador in this world, as though as God was making His reconciliation to people through you. What a privilege! What an honor! What a overwhelming task! And that He uses such an insignificant person as I. But I know that I have the Spirit of God living inside of me, and as long as I worship Him in spirit and truth, then I can live in spirit and truth. So, will you follow Jesus? Will you consume? the bread of life. 
Before we look at Luke chapter 9, I want to mention to you a little bit about the book of Habakkuk. How many even know what it's about? See, we, we need to read and study God's Word. And as we're, as we're walking along the road to Emmaus, we realize that Jesus opens up their, their eyes to Scripture and that all Scripture points to Him. If you look at the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk cries out these, all these woes about, God, why are you not answering things in my time? And, and it points out to God's promises and promises through Jesus and that there will be a new people that worship Him. He's tired of the injustice and the idolatry because the world lives for Babylon. They're captive of Babylon. The days look the same today. There's not much difference there. It was the way of Habakkuk's time. It's the way of our time. It's the way it was in Jesus' time. There was so much injustice because Babylon lived for the wealth of this world and power and greed. Boy, it sounds like today. And he cried out for those who were being marginalized and, and suffering. Do you have compassion? Are you trying to help those? Or are you storing up your own wealth? Jesus has called you. He's given you authority and power to make a difference in this world. To go out and do things that you can do in your power, in your ability, in God's ability for you. But only if you're willing to do that and to preach the truth. That Jesus Christ has come and died for our sins. And that if anyone believes in Him, they can be saved. But then we're supposed to train up disciples and teaching them everything to, be, to obey. So are you obeying? Do you lack the faith to truly live? Jesus is God's only answer. Is He your only answer to all the problems in your life and the answer to other people's problems because you come alongside in compassion and try to, to, to do something to help them. For two years, Jesus has taught His disciples, and now He is sending them out to do. This is the point that we're at. Luke 9, verses 1 through 13. When Jesus had called the twelve together, He gave them power and authority to drive out all the demons and cure diseases. And He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave, that, leave their town and shake the dust off of your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard all about what was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had risen from the dead. Others said that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with, took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who, who needed healing. Later, Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. So this is where we're at in Luke chapter 9. He send, Jesus sends out His twelve. He gives them power and authority. He says, be dependent upon Me, not anything else. Go out and do these miracles because you have the power of the Spirit in you, the same Spirit that's in the church today, but we don't see as many miracles. And I think part of that reason is because we don't have as much faith, do we? And preach to them about the kingdom of God, the good news of Jesus Christ. When they came back, and we see the port in there of Herod questioning who it is, the, the popularity of Jesus had reached to the king even. Who is this Jesus? This is this pivotal point that we're reaching at where we get the proclamation of Peter saying that you are the Messiah, you are the chosen one of God. And Jesus goes to take them to a quiet place to talk to them more, to train them more, but he can't because of the crowds. And then Jesus does what? He does good deeds for them and teaches them until late in the evening. Now it only makes sense. It's late in the evening. They're in a deserted place. And they say, you need to send these people away because they need to find lodging and they need to get them something to eat. 
And what does Jesus say? He wasn't able to teach them earlier, so what did he say here? You give them something to eat. Strange, isn't it? I just came back. I haven't had time to talk about the mission trip we just went to and everything. i uh, got to rest a little bit. I've just been out. I thought that was my mission field, but my mission field's here too, isn't it? You give them to eat. You do it. Well, we can't. This is beyond our capabilities. Well, of course it is. We're fighting a spiritual battle here, not a physical battle. Where is your faith? At least Andrew had enough faith to bring a little boy, didn't he? But even him, he said... Uh, what can we do with all, as little as this? Well, it doesn't matter how insignificant you are, how many problems you have, anything else, God can and will use you if you let Him. He'll, as a matter of fact, just show how great He is through how weak you are. Isn't that a biblical principle? Do you believe and do you live by faith, trusting in Jesus, the only one who could save you, the only one who can save your family, the only one who can perform the miracles and give the bread of life to those who will choose to believe? Will it be everybody that you encounter? No. Will it be most people you encounter? No. Will it be a few that you encounter? Maybe. Will there be one or two along the road? Yes, if you're faithful. Because God is faithful. And if you brought one person to salvation in your lifetime because of the way you lived and what you proclaimed, would it not be worth it? Especially if it was your family, your friends. Up to this point, Luke has clearly presented who Jesus is, what it means to be a disciple, what faith looks like. And now it's time to live like Christ in this world. So will you listen? Will you trust Will you do it even when you know you don't have the means to do it? Dad, it's Father's, Dad's, it's Father's Day. You, your children, your wives are looking for you especially, not to be the physical breadwinner. Come on. We get caught up in that too much, but God will supply our needs. He supplies for the birds of the, of the air, does He not? He will supply the needs for your family. Your importance is to give them that spiritual bread to talk about God's grace, His love, when you get up, when you go about, when you sit down, when you go to bed, to write it on the doorpost of their hearts. <clears throat> James tells us in James chapter 1, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Do you persevere, per, persevere in preaching the word to your children and praying with them and to your wife? Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Paul tells us in Philippians, your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident that of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. He also says later, know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together in one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved. Is your, light, is your life a light? Is it burning brightly? Does it need to get a little bit of extra fuel? Then turn to God, turn to the Holy Spirit, and tell Him to ignite you. He says to Timothy, Paul does, he says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trusting to be to reliable people who also will be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serves as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by complete, competing according to the rules. Are you living your life according to the Word of God? According to the Spirit, how the Spirit directs you? Are you training up your children in the same way? The truth and the power and the life are still the same today. So what would Jesus be doing today? And how would he be sending you out today if he was right here with you? Oh, and he is right here with you. Scripture says he'll never forsake you. At the point that the disciples went out, they weren't empowered fully by the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Holy Spirit. That came at Pentecost. You have been. You have an advantage they didn't have that day. 
And you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins. They did not know that that day. What's holding you from going out? Do you cry out like Habakkuk does? Do you even do that first to see the injustices? To know that if, if you don't treat, to train your children the way that you should, that they might perish? Or do you live your life for other things? Who is your God? Who is on the throne? Do you, love, do you believe and do you love and do you trust Jesus enough to give your life up, to deny yourself, because that's coming up in just a few more verses, to take up your cross daily and to follow after Jesus? I'll give you a few words from Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will, and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and ne never at rest because he is, is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives all the people. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors certainly suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed, shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. But you say, well, I don't do that. I just mind my own business and build up my own wealth and, and my home and everything. But are you going out and doing what Jesus taught? To think of others before yourself, to judge not lest you be judged, to give. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Now I add these words in, but will Christians cry out? Does your life look like what Jesus would be if he was here today sending you out with the power of the Holy Spirit because he has already given you power and authority and He is walking with you today. Let me remind you what the first words of Jesus were to the people in Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. You can't do that if they're starving, if, they, if, you, if you won't go out, if you're alienated from them. You've got to go do something to help them and then tell them the good news. Maybe you don't have the power to, inside of you, the faith inside of you to cast out demons and, and God doesn't do party favors. But maybe you will see a miracle if you walk in faith and, and encounter something like that. But if you're not going to the poor, how will you ever know it? He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. So you've got to be going to the marginalized. You've got to care about them. You've got to be doing something. And then to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor to say that, hey, Jesus Christ, do you know Him? He is the answer to all of your needs. I might could help you with physical bread today, but He can help you with spiritual bread. After doing good, Jesus said this in verse 43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns because that is why I sent. The people wanted him to stay there, but he said, I can't stay here doing good here. I've got to go on doing good and proclaim the good news. So I have to sit here and examine my own life and say, am I doing something or am I just sitting here? No, I'm not doing these things that are all evil and everything else, but am I going to the poor and needy? Do they mean anything to me? Do I even care enough about my own to fervently pray and to do things with my own friends and family? Am I doing what Jesus has commanded me to do? As we progress through Luke, some of, the, some of the words you'll find in red are, and this is particular to Peter, I have to point that out because he's going to be the one professing that Jesus is the Messiah when so many others walk away. Put out in the deep water and let down the nets for your catch. Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. That was to the disciples who, who were considering whether they should give up everything to follow Jesus or not. To those who thought they were righteous... <laughs> 
and really weren't, Jesus' words, it's not, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So are you a disciple, or are you one who just thinks he's righteous? Because a disciple goes and does. A disciple denies himself, takes up his cross, and follows after Jesus. We've got to point this out, because this is where we're coming to in Luke's gospel. This is what he wrote an orderly account for, so that you know that you believe. You either are a disciple of Jesus Christ, or you're not. And if you're not, don't be surprised if there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. In chapter 6, after Jesus explains how you're blessed and he explains the woes and everything on the Sermon of the Plain, he clearly states, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? In chapter 7, we, we learn also what that generation looked like and what this generation looked like. Not the generation of unbelievers, but the generation of Israel that proclaimed to be uh, God's children. But wisdom is proved right by her children. And he says this after saying you're basically a bunch of spoiled, rotten children. In chapter 8, we have the first parable, that parable of the sower that went out to spread his seed, and the seed was planted everywhere. Uh, we concentrate so many times on how that seed was, but the point is the farmer went out to plant the seed, and the seed is the word of God. Are you planting? Has it been planted in your heart so you can plant? And then Jesus' physical relatives come to him. And his answer is, my mothers and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So where do I fit in in this gospel? Who is Jesus to me? Will I obey him? Do I have the faith to trust him even when, oh, it's unimaginable to have trust? But trust is complete confidence in things that I can't see. And without faith, it's, it's impossible to please God. So here we are to Luke chapter 9. When Jesus called the 12 together, what did Jesus do? He called those 12 that had committed themselves, the church, the beginning of the church, however you want to do it, and said, I've given you a lot of training, let's put it into action. But you still need to learn something. You need to learn to be dependent, totally dependent. You need to learn that desperate need, and now you need to learn to be dependent. So I'm sending you out with nothing but the power and authority I've given you. Go do it. And they did. He gave them power and authority to do what? To drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Demonic activities no less today than it was then. Diseases that are there, maybe we can do something about them. Don't laugh at, at healings, but you know, question and test the, the truth of the Spirit out there too. But it's still the same. You have the power to go out and pray over somebody, and it's very possible they might be healed. That power and authority is the same. It was to do what? To drive out demonic activity, to cure diseases, to heal people, to do something for them. The healing could have simply been, like I said, they're starving to death, give them something to eat. Verse 2, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. You do something first before you proclaim the kingdom of God. There's a good verse for what you asked about right there to go with. He made relationship with the people, did things for them, and then proclaimed God's favor. Yeah, you can proclaim judgment at the same point. But the point is, is that God loves you enough that He gave His one and only Son to die for you. And they're not going to believe you if you come with hypocrisy. They're going to believe you when you come out of compassion and love and are doing something, whether the miracles are as strong as what the, God, the disciples did at this point or not. To proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Wait a minute. Jesus already said to heal the sick, did He not? Well, there's two words here, one that means cure and one means heal. Isn't that the same thing? Well, not exactly. The first word is therapy. It's to give therapy, in other words, where we get that word from. It's used to describe the Lord's miracles. So you come in the Lord's power, and I don't know what the miracles are and everything, but you heal them. Like I said, it may be giving a cup of water to the least of these, Scripture tells us. <clears throat> and the second word Yamu is used to express spiritual healing. So you come in the Lord's name to bring physical healing, whatever that looks like, which then you talk about spiritual healing, which is exactly what the Scripture is, just by studying the words. So you go out and do the physical to present the spiritual. Verse 3, he told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. You must have faith if you want to see these miracles happen, especially spiritual healing, because that's what we care about more than we care about the other. I mean, I would love to be cured of leprosy, but I'd love to know my sins were cured for all eternity much more. 
So you're bringing them the truth of Jesus and you're meeting their physical needs. He told them not to even take a walking stick if you notice that in there. Why? <laughs> I don't know. There's your answer. But he wanted them to be totally dependent because of what would a walking stick have hurt? He wanted them to be totally dependent to supply all their needs to go into ministry. And like I said, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to be prepared, but sometimes we put off our starting point or we don't do this mission trip because we don't get the funds or whatever it is and we lack the power of the Spirit in going out. And maybe that's why we don't see as many miracles and therefore as many conversions. Verse 4, Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Rely on them to partner with you with the gospel message because you're to go to make disciples. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet in a testimony against them. Don't take this out of context because a lot of people do. It just means that you went out to the pagan land, you were out there willing to do it, and they rejected. So when you come back, you shake it off to get the defilement off you, getting it off of you, but also a statement against them that you've left them to contemplate whether they're going to repent and turn from their sins or not. Verse 6, So they went out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. They did exactly what Jesus to do. They had everything they needed to do it, what He commanded them to do. And this first missionary trip, or whatever you want to say, was successful. But then we read in Luke's account, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets long ago came back to life. Okay, These were the disciples doing these miracles, but it pointed back to Jesus. So Herod, the king, is seeing all these things done by Jesus and his disciples. Remember, John had disciples. John went to Herod and said, Hey, you shouldn't have taken your brother's wife, and he got put in prison. John had fear that he didn't want to kill him till. His, uh, the woman he stole's daughter <laughs> uh, danced a seductive dance in front of him. I put seductive there, the words in the Bible, but I figured that was the only way that would please a man enough to say, I'll give you half of my kingdom. I enjoyed it so much. So, And what did she ask for? John's head on a platter. And that happened. Well, this happened right about this time that all this other was going on in the world. All this is going on in the world and you're telling your friends about Jesus and everything and you're going out and you're doing these things. All this goes along and it's breaking news on CNN what happened today. Does it change anything in your mission? The world's going to wonder who Jesus is because you're out there doing the miracles that Jesus did with power and authority or you're not doing them and they're not wondering. And then they're just focused on the news. John had come and preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and to produce works that prove that you've repented. And even Herod wondered who this might be. He might have had fear from what he did with John. We don't know that from Scripture or anything. But what we do know is that he wanted, because of all this commotion, he wanted to see Jesus. So we'll read on. But Herod said, I beheaded John, who then is this I hear such things about? Jesus was known all over. But it doesn't matter if you know who Jesus is. It matters if you know Jesus personally in your heart and He's your Lord. And he tried to see Him. Well, he didn't get to see Jesus at that point, but he did get to see Jesus later if we study Scripture. We'll know that that the Greeks said, well, wait a minute, Pontius said, I don't know about this. I'll give him to Herod for the jurisdiction. And he goes back to Herod. And Herod asked Jesus all kind of questions, and he hopes that he'll see him do a miracle. That's what he wanted to see. And hopefully a personal miracle. Let me get Jesus over here alone. Let him do this miracle for me. This I couldn't do on my own, but do I want to make him Lord and Savior? But Jesus was silent before him. And Herod dressed him up in robes and mocked him and sent him back. Wow. Verse 10. We're back to the apostles returning. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them and withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. So you don't know what all they did, but you do know what they did because they went out and obeyed Jesus and it said before that, that they did the things Jesus said and they cured people and cast out demons and they spread the gospel message. They planted the seed. 
We don't know what seed fell on good soil. We don't know what seed fell on rocky. We don't know what seed fell on the path. We don't know any of these things. We know that they went out and planted seed because the seed was in them. And then he took them and withdrew to the, by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. Jesus withdrew with them to speak with them. Whether he knew what was going to happen or next, we don't know, but we do know what happens next. But, verse 11, he couldn't speak to the disciples in private because the crowds learned about it and followed him. They heard everything that the Christians, the disciples were doing, and they knew what Jesus was doing, and they wanted even more to see Jesus because these 12 were living like Jesus in the world, spreading the gospel message. And what did Jesus do? He welcomed them. He didn't say, oh, wait a minute, I need five minutes by myself. I was going to train the disciples. He had compassion, and he welcomed them. And what did he do? He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Because this is what it's about. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Show me that your faith is real. Obey Jesus. Love others as Jesus has loved you. And he healed those who needed healing. He did the same things that he sent out, the same pattern that we have. He did good deeds and he told them about the kingdom of God. No judgmentalism at this point. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowds away. Why? It only makes perfect sense. The day is long. You wanted to talk to us in private. We're all exhausted and tired. We don't have food to feed these people. And you know you got to have physical bread, right, guys? I mean, there's no way you could go without dinner today. You surely would die, wouldn't you? What's more important, their souls or their tummies? Well, to most people, their tummies, right? Why? So they can go to surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. It makes total, total physical sense. That's why I had Mark read from Proverbs and why I read it and expounded upon it. It is perfectly logical in my steps, but what about the supernatural? Did you understand what your mission field was that day? Because they missed the fact that their mission field was still there. It was on the other side of the lake again now, or wherever it was. In Luke twenty two thirty five, 35, Jesus says, When I sent you out without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. I remind you of that before I read verse 13, because verse 13 says, He replied, You give them something to eat. Fathers, because today's Father's Day, are you feeding spiritual food to your wives? To your children, to the rest of your family and friends, to your co-workers, to the least of these. Because what's more important? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you caught up in the things of this world, building up treasures for yourself? No, you're not evil uh, axe murderers or whatever you want to say out there. But are you doing what Jesus commanded you to do? And what's more important, would you give up, would you do whatever to save your wife, to save your children, to save your grandchildren? Because there's nothing you can do to do that. You can't save yourself, of course. But what's impossible for man is possible with God. Do you believe this? And does it make you live your life in spirit and truth because these are the kind of worshipers that the Father is seeking the day has come when we will worship in spirit and truth are you feeding them Jesus and Jesus only if you are feeding them bread are you substituting with other things saying well when, when things aren't just enough here do this on your own are you telling them that Jesus is your everything that you sustain everything that you have for life, abundant life, for peace, for joy, for everything else based on what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross and He will carry it all the way to completion. Do you want to see miracles? Then are you being led by the Spirit? Are you living a life by the Spirit? Are you being prayerfully dependent? 
feed your family, your friends, your co-workers, the bread of life each and every day. There's nothing more important that you could do. I got you a little Father's Day gift, and Kira did this little decoration up here for us. This one says, walk by faith, not by sight, 2 Corinthians. And this one says, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power from Ephesians. So all fathers, you are welcome to get one. It's my present for you guys. I wish I could stress enough, and of course this applies to every Christian. If you only had today to live for Jesus, would it look any differently, dads, than it would? Otherwise, if you didn't think about that statement. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a mighty, loving God, compassionate, long-suffering, and kind. And just at the right moment, while we were enemies, you sent your son to die for us. Luke has presented clearly in his gospel who Jesus is and that he is the bread of life, that he is the Messiah, the chosen one of God. And he has given us power and authority if we believe and trust in him to follow him. So especially as a father, Lord, I pray you increase my faith so that I live a life of worth, so that I don't let other things distract, so that I don't let things scare me, Lord, but that I live a life that my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my friends, this church, everyone, even my enemies can see that I live by faith, not by sight. Lord, I thank you and praise you, for you are God worthy of all glory and praise and honor. Empower us with the Spirit and with the truth, Lord. Thank you that we have the freedom to read your word anywhere and everywhere in the different translations, Lord. Help us to study to be an approved workman that rightly handles the word of truth. And I just thank you and praise you until the day that we meet Jesus face to face. face, to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.